Welcome to week three of module one. This week we're going to look at how you can present a convincing argument to others. I'm going to skip over some aspects and save those for later in the course, but we're going to make use of some of the things that you've done so far in the module to get you started. Now you may have heard the word rhetoric used before. It's often employed in a negative way. A politician might be accused of rhetoric if somebody disagrees with what they're saying or thinks that it's not backed up by evidence. But the correct meaning of the word is generally more positive. Rhetoric is the art of using language in a way that informs or persuades. Now you may have heard some persuasive speakers or read books or articles that have made you reconsider your opinion about something or deepened your support for a particular cause. Understanding the things that make something persuasive is a good way of thinking about the way that you talk or write about the things that are important to you. Now, the Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote uh, a famous treatise on rhetoric nearly 2,300 years ago, which is still seen as the most important document on the subject. In it, he identified three key ingredients for effective rhetoric. Ethos, that's the credibility of the speaker or the writer. Logos, that's the intellectual credibility of the argument, and pathos, the emotional power of the speaking or the writing. So logos is the appeal to reason, and it means word in ancient Greek, and it's where we get the English word logic from. We tend to be persuaded by logical arguments, particularly when supported by data and facts, especially if we can understand them. Ethos means credibility, and this is the appeal to character, and it's where we get the English word ethical. If the person who is talking to us clearly knows what they're talking about, then they have credibility, and we're more likely to be swayed by them. Now, credibility can come from a number of different areas. You can be an expert in something because you've studied it for a long time or because you've lived it. A surgeon might be an expert in what makes the heart work, but only someone who's had a heart attack can tell you what it feels like. Both have credibility, but of very different types. And pathos is the appeal to emotion. And this word originally means suffering or an experience, something that you've experienced. Um, it's a word that exists today in the English language, but it tends to be seen as sadness. Something that's pathetic is often thought to be sad, or in modern terms, something that's not very good. But in rhetorical terms, pathos relates to emotion. Someone with pathos can convey emotion, whether it be joy, anger, frustration or sadness. Now, you might think that the key to a persuasive presentation of uh, a topic or an argument is to employ a lot of facts and figures. But on their own, these tend not to mean much to people. Numbers are very difficult to grasp when divorced from their context. We're more likely to donate money towards disaster relief by hearing the story of a single survivor than by being told how many thousands of people were suffering. And if someone who had witnessed or experienced the disaster firsthand told that story, then it would be even more persuasive. If you watch or listen to a good presenter, then the chances are that they employ all three of these aspects in different ways. 
They give you facts and evidence. They exude credibility. And they connect it all together with emotions. The way they do this is often through stories. But these stories establish their credibility. They encourage an emotional response and they make use of evidence. So, if you want to persuade someone to support your project, you need to do three things. You need some evidence, facts, numbers, quotations. You need credibility. What makes you an expert? And you need an emotional story, either about someone else or about yourself. To get a good idea of how these three ingredients work, I'm going to ask you to take a look at two examples. Firstly, I'd like you to watch a TED talk by the singer-songwriter Amanda Palmer, who cropped up in week two, you might remember. The talk is called The Art of Asking, and in it, Amanda explores the subject of asking strangers to help you and faith in the generosity and support of others. So pause this video and go to the URL on the screen or you'll find it in the notes. So now hopefully you've watched or listened to the talk. Uh, you might want to go back and watch it again if you need to in order to answer these questions. So the first question is, how credible did you find Amanda? What right do you think she has to be talking about asking people for help? And the second question is, what evidence does she have to back up her argument? Or is it all just her opinion? And thirdly, how did her speech make you feel? Did it leave you completely untouched? Or were you sad? Were you angry? Were you amused? Anything else? And if it did leave an emotional mark on you, did it work for or against her argument? So have a think about those questions now. So pause the video again. If you need to, go back and watch Amanda Palmer's talk again. It's well worth watching twice. Um, and then have a think about these questions before proceeding to the next one. Now I want you to look at another TED talk by Hajira Khan. The speaker is someone just like you, a young person from the Commonwealth who identified a problem and decided to do something about it. In fact, you may have read her story on the course website, and if you haven't, go to the course website and look it up. It's really well worth reading. Now, Hajira is not a performer like Amanda Palmer, so she's not used to appearing in front of a large crowd. But because she follows the ingredients, most likely, and in fact I'm sure that she didn't realise she was following those three ingredients, her talk is incredibly persuasive. So pause this video and go and watch or listen to her now, again using the URL on screen or in the notes. So now again, the same sort of questions. How credible do you think that the speaker was? Did she have any experience of the problem that, that she encountered? In what way did she have that experience? The second question is, what evidence did she use? And then finally, did her talk affect you emotionally? Did it help or hinder her case? So pause this video, have a think about those questions, and again, if you need to go back and watch the talk again, do so. I think you'll find it really, really useful to try and analyse the way it works. So now 
I want you to try. I don't want you to do quite what Hajira and Amanda Palmer did, but I'm going to walk you through a process to help you build a story that uses the rhetorical principles I described earlier. In weeks one and two, you started gathering some of this if you did the activities. And if you didn't, well, don't worry, you can go back and do them any time. We're going to establish your credibility. Provide some evidence, you probably have lots of this already, and try to add some emotion if you need to. As you go through each of these sections, I want you to jot down some notes, just bullet points for now, because I'm going to ask you to spend the whole week thinking about each of these aspects, and we'll do something with them next week. So firstly, what's your story? We're coming full circle now. Remember how we started off talking about how the key to getting people interested in you or your idea was to tell a story. And that an important aspect of that was having a hero, a central character the readers or listeners could support. And I said that hero should be you. Now this is the ethos I described earlier. It's the credibility that helps people say, this young man or woman knows what they are talking about. And remember the first rule we established in week one. Start with why. So think of a story. And the story should be about you. It should be something that you experienced or something that you witnessed. Even though the story may in effect be about someone else, the idea is for you to establish yourself. So tell it through your eyes. How did it make you feel? How did you react? What did you decide needed to happen? And then use your evidence, gather it together. Is your story unique? Or does it happen a lot? And to how many people? How often? This is where you provide the facts to underpin your story. Where you can, you need to provide references. So make a note of where you got the information from and make sure in turn that it's credible. For example, instead of quoting a blog, find out where they got their data from and visit the source yourself to make sure you're using it correctly. If you use data without backing it up, people will soon find out and it will completely undermine your argument. So be very careful with this. Find some data and make sure it stands up. And then add some emotion, if you need it. Now chances are the emotion is already in your story. You shouldn't need to create it. But sometimes a story can be very dry or be about something that your audience can't really connect with and so you have to add some emotion to it in the way that you tell the story, in the way that you convey it to your audience. So for example, your audience may never have experienced famine, but they have experienced hunger. Now they're not the same thing at all, but you could say something like, remember the last time you skipped a meal and you had to go through the day feeling hungry? Remember how you felt? how difficult it was to concentrate, how the hunger gnawed at you. Now imagine that ten times worse, and every single day. That's not even close to how real hunger feels. Now adding emotion like this isn't cynical or exploitation. You may feel uncomfortable with it and say something like, the data should tell the story, but data doesn't get followers and supporters. When was the last time you read a novel or watched a movie that was simply a list of facts and figures? Emotion is crucial, so stand back from your story and your data and ask yourself, does this make people sad or angry or happy or hopeful? If it does at least one of those things, you're probably okay. 
assuming the emotion is appropriate. Now ask yourself this. When you think about your story, do you feel anything? Does it still make you angry, happy, sad, hopeful? If not, then how are you going to get other people to feel anything? What's missing? So you might be able to guess where this module is heading, but for now, I would like you simply to sit back and jot down your ideas in response to the points I just made. Identify your story, your ethos, your facts. Take some time. I advise you to start being as visual as you can with your notes. And what I mean is, get them out of a notebook and onto a wall. Create a mind map or write thoughts on post-it notes or index cards. Then put them somewhere you'll constantly see them. Move them around. Rewrite them. And if you can, and this is a really useful tip, so take note. Invite a friend, a family member, or even a stranger to look at them as you explain what you're doing. Ask them to ask you questions and use their questions to revise your notes. Take photographs if you can and share them more widely, for example on the Queen's Young Leaders Facebook group. Share your thoughts and your questions and then add your own thoughts and questions to other people's. The more people you get feedback from, the better your story will be. I'm going to end by recommending three books that I think will help you with putting together your story. The first is Resonate by Nancy Duarte. This is a really good book and in it she talks about using story structures to craft your message. I really strongly recommend it. It's a really good book. Talk Like Ted by Carmine Gallo is a very interesting book that takes apart some of the best TED Talks and works out why they're so useful. And it also includes more on the three aspects of rhetoric that I've mentioned. And then the third book is slightly different. This is the Mind Map book by Tony Buzan. It's a useful primer on how to create really effective mind maps for visual thinking. And I've used this with students for years and those who get into it swear by it. It's a really useful way of thinking through problems. So let's recap. To get people to support you or to make use of your idea, you need to be able to convince them. Facts on their own won't do it. Passion on its own won't do it. And emotions on their own won't do it. But combine all these things together and you have the key ingredients of a persuasive story. Now, it's not as simple as I've made it sound, of course. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of redrafting, rewriting, rethinking, scrapping it and starting again. But if you recognise the need for these three things, then you're on your way. This is where it starts. So that's it for week three. I've given you a lot to do. So... Try and find some time now to think about the things that I've talked about. Rewatch this video, rewatch the videos that I recommended to you. And if you can, try and get hold of copies of those books. I think you'll find them really useful. Next week, we're going to be doing something very practical with all this information. So the more you're able to do, so get those post-it notes, get those index cards, write down things on them and stick them on the wall and get people to talk about them. The more you do, the better prepared you'll be for what I'm going to ask you to do next week. I'll see you then.